Every road to conception is different. Every pregnancy experience is different. Every parenting experience is different. So you can't be didactic in the way that often books or experts are, but instead be welcoming to all kinds of experiences and just provide that sense that you're not alone. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show. I am so delighted to have author Heidi Murkoff on today's show, and we're going to talk about all the amazing things that she's done. The title of today's show is What to Expect. Welcome, Heidi. Thank you. It's so great to be with you. And by the way, you had me at Egg Whisperer. (laughs) I just love that title. Thank you, Heidi. So I would like to share with our listeners more about you. So Heidi Murkoff is the author of the internationally best-selling What to Expect series of pregnancy and parenting guides, which includes what to expect when you're expecting, what to expect when you're eating well, when you're expecting, what to expect the first year, and what to expect before you're expecting. She has sold over 40 million copies in 45 different languages. She is also the creator of whattoexpect.com and what to expect app, a community of 20 million moms and founder of the what to expect project, a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping at-risk moms in the U S and around the world. Time magazine named her one of the 100 most influential people in the world for 2011. She and her husband, Eric, have received numerous awards for their humanitarian work, including in June of 2022, the highest award given to civilians by the Department of Defense, the Fisher Distinguished Civilian Humanitarian Award. So honored to have her on today to talk about what to expect before and when you're expecting. So many people know of you, not many, millions of people know of you and your amazing books. Can you tell us about the start of what to expect when you're expecting? I think many people in the audience can probably relate to your inspiration for how this book got its start. I got knocked up. It was an oops pregnancy. We had just gotten married and two months, three months later, oops, I was pregnant. And I was so young and knew absolutely nothing. I was the definition of clueless. First thing I did was run to the bookstore and bought like the two or three books that were on the shelf, I think it was only two, and brought them home, read them, found them uniformly terrifying. I could not relate to what was going on in my body based on this information. And two hours before I went into labor with Emma, I delivered a proposal for a book that would become what to expect when you're expecting. So it was a busy day. It was a productive day. My first venture into multitasking as a mom, but yeah, it was a mom on a mission. Simple, never expected anyone to buy it. I pretty much thought if a handful of parents slept better at night than Eric and I had, I would have accomplished what I set out to do. Wow. What a great story. And the What to Expect series has grown so much since then. What has been at the heart of this growth and your passion for the topics around what to expect? First book, What to Expect When You're Expecting, has changed a lot since the first day that it hit the shelves. What keeps me going and what motivates me and what inspires me is helping moms, dads through this experience and answer the questions that they had that for me went unanswered. By the way, I could have spent 24 seven on the phone with my OB, but but in a funny way, I wasn't empowered even at that point to do that because there was very little of that empowerment in pregnancy for women at that time. It's evolved over the years and grown, but the mission is the very same mission that I've always had from the first day. And that is to provide that support, that empowering knowledge. It's especially empowering when you're pregnant or you're a new parent. And because things keep evolving and things keep changing, and because I love moms, babies, dads, families more than I can even begin to tell you, I this is my life. This is my life for the rest of my life. It was unexpected, but I'm so grateful for that. Yeah. We can see your passion and what you do with the foundation. I know we're going to get more into that as well. 
And I've heard you say that your books are like a hug. And I know so many people feel seen and heard in ways that they might have before. What has been your approach in each of your books? First of all, I think it's important to remember that motherhood is the ultimate sisterhood and that we all share a universal bond, no matter what our socioeconomic, religious, racial, cultural, political profile. There are no red moms, blue moms, moms of different religions. It just breaks down all barriers. We are moms. Dads, I would say it's the ultimate brotherhood being a dad, but it's that connection that ties us together. And I think that hopefully comes across in the books where I'm not just telling you what to do because my experience is my experience. Your experience is your experience. Every pregnancy experience is different. Every road to conception is different. Every parenting experience is different. So you can't be didactic in the way that often books or experts are, but instead be welcoming to all kinds of experiences and, and just provide that sense that you're not alone. All that gave me goosebumps. So thank you for sharing that. It did. I know I'm not saying anything that people don't know about the rise in stress over the past two and a half years. And I see more people experiencing stress in different ways as patients. You're obviously an expert in so many things. How can couples and partners approach trying to conceive a pregnancy in ways that support their relationship and each other? That's such an important question. And you're right. Stress has the stress on couples, the stress on parents, the stress on families has risen exponentially during the pandemic. For a lot of people, it was a nice rest at home and then you had a break and a lot of babies got conceived. But for others, it just, it showed up some of the, some of the issues in your relationship. You're all of a sudden together 24 seven. In terms of that TTC journey, which of course my first one was a journey of the unexpected, But for lots of couples, it's more of a struggle. And for lots of couples, it's a lot of a struggle. And if I could say the one thing you need to do is put your relationship, and this goes for parenting too, don't put your relationship on the back burner. Make sure that your relationship is the focus because it's that love that hopefully will create this life. And it's that love that can best sustain it. So the goal is you and your partner first, if you have a partner, otherwise be all about yourself, nurture yourself, take care of yourself. That's equally as important. And then the rest is less important. And the less, the less emphasis we put on the actual act of making a baby and more on the love that you have for each other. We all hear stories of couples who conceive as soon as they stop trying, and that's for a reason, because they're not trying, because they're just enjoying each other. Not that always works, because sometimes there are physical barriers to conception for him, for her, for both of them sometimes, whether it's a quick journey to sperm and egg meeting or a long journey, putting your relationship first, that's the most important part. Yeah. Yeah. And then you mentioned a little bit about relationships changing. How do they change through the phases of growing a family? We've been married 40 years. I don't even know how that's possible, but, and have enjoyed every single day of those 40 years, even the really, the early sleep deprivation days. And because we went straight from honeymoon to baby, no baby moon time at all. And So I think part of it was that we stayed invested in each other. We had a relationship beyond being a couple of parents. We were a couple. So we made time for each other. Even just connecting through touch is so important. Even a hug, a little grab your butt, whatever, hand holding, you know, and always the kisses when you can. And not always being about being parents, but being about that couple, focusing your attention on that. Babies take a lot of attention. Absolutely. Children do. Absolutely. 
but securing that time for just the two of us, for us, it was, we sit down and have a snack with the kids when they ate dinner, and then we'd have our dinner afterwards. N not realistic for a lot of couples. We worked at home, so it was a lot easier, but still making that effort, whatever that effort is on both sides is really important. And communication, communication is key. So much incredible advice. I feel like all of your wisdom should be on mugs, t-shirts, hats. And your first book came around the time and you share that so lovingly with us of how, you know, what to expect was inspired by the birth of Emma and how has being a mother played a role in the books? So again, my experience is different than your experience, but you know, just having that perspective, I think walking in a pregnant woman's shoes and knowing that her shoes don't fit because her feet are swollen. I think that really helps. It's not a matter of, I know exactly what you're going through. And I've met moms in South Sudan and in Bangladesh who I felt instantly connected to our experiences, vastly different. The challenges that we face, vastly different, but yet I relate to your experience in some fundamental way. So being a mom is for me really an important part of that. And a mom who didn't always know what to do and didn't always know what to expect far, far from it. So I think perspective is really an important part of that. Being a mom, it's funny because I make mistakes. I learn from them. Sometimes you don't learn from your mistakes, but <laughs> I can embrace that you're going to have those days and you're going to lose it. And that's okay because I've been there at the bewitching hour. I know what it's like to have a baby with colic. Actually, two. <laughs> I was two for two. <laughs> and I don't know if that's because I'm a stressy person, but that perspective helps immeasurably. I love it. And can you tell me more about how your family has been a part of the what to expect world? So besides being the inspiration for what to expect when you're expecting, when it came time, I was doing the fifth edition of the book and I realized, wait a second, Emma just got pregnant, by the way, through IVF. Oh, wow. So Lennox is an IVF baby. And so she was pregnant. I'm like, oh, perfect cover for the book, like full circle. And a lot of people say, is that you on the book? And I'm like, no, I don't even have <laughs> photographs of myself pregnant. We didn't even have a camera. Like there are two old Polaroids. That's it. Right. But that's Emma on the cover. And that's Lennox on the cover first year. And he was a baby because he was in the right uterus at the right time. What I'd love to get your perspective on, what has changed since you mm -hmm. first wrote What to Expect? Let's start with in the world of trying to conceive and pregnancy. First of all, getting pregnant in the first place, that wasn't something we really thought a lot about. Clearly, I didn't give it a second thought. I just got knocked up. But back in my mother's generation, my grandmother's generation, it was a matter of, it was something you did. Every woman did it. And there wasn't, when a woman couldn't get pregnant, really very little attention was paid to it. Just like quiet whispers around. There were very few options in terms of getting pregnant. So it was something that every woman had to do. If she didn't, then there was something a little off about her. And now we do, we read a book like What to Expect Before You're Expecting to prepare for even getting pregnant. And let's face it, a lot of things about pregnancy have never changed, will never change. It's still about not months, give or take, right? And month is always the hardest if you have to go there. I did, but you're bloated, queasy, and constipated, mood swings. But so many things have changed. And I think recommendations, guidelines, all that stuff, all the medical stuff. I've updated my books recently to cover COVID during pregnancy. I mean, it's so lots of things change. At the same time, I think what, what I would say has changed the most, and you can look at the cover of What to Expect and see that Emma is joyful on the cover. She is happy to be pregnant. She's proud to be pregnant. She's showing off her belly and she's smiling, which is a far cry from what we used to do. You had to wear like a polyester pup tent that you could sleep a family of four under. Like you did not show that you were pregnant because that was considered like dirty, right? So it's that sense of pride of 
of purpose, of being empowered as a woman about your body. That was something we didn't know much about, what was happening to your body. The cover is sort of a metaphor for how things have changed. And another way that they've changed a lot is that I had no pregnant friends. We were the first, like we weren't planning to get pregnant. We were the first kids on the block to get pregnant. And so I didn't have anybody who could relate except for Eric and he'd never been pregnant before. So we were just thrust into this without that support system. Now you're pregnant, you sign up on what to expect app. If you have enough time on your hands, you can make thousands, millions of friends who are going through the same experience at the same time. So that is, I feel, makes it so much less lonely. It still can be very lonely. And during COVID, it was certainly extremely lonely. Another difference is that we pay more attention to mental health. I mean, until recently, we never talked about but it's so critical for moms to know what the signs are of a maternal mood disorder and to be able to seek treatment and feel like there's no stigma in that. So we, a, a lot of changes for the better. I would say a mixed blessing about Dr. Google because you can go down a lot of rabbit holes. I had no information. Now you can have way, way, way TMI to an extent that your head's spinning and a lot of conflicting information. And so you really have to be careful what you read online. And there's more stress on parents than ever before, especially on moms. So in terms of things that have changed, yeah, lots of things. I put my babies to sleep on their tummies. We put them to sleep on their backs now. We have, we started our babies on solids at four months now. We know that's not appropriate and don't do the rice cereal. And now it's six months and it's baby led weaning. So a lot of those things have changed but the pressure to be a perfect parent, which by the way, by definition for human parents does not exist, is so great to be a perfect woman, to be a perfect wife, to be or partner, to be a perfect mom. No such thing. Don't even try. Don't even try. So I think Instagram and other social media just puts that pressure on and you need to relieve that. So using social media more as a support system than as something to measure up again. And then what have you seen change as far as how society sees family growth since you wrote What to Expect? So in terms of family growth, I would say I meet a lot of moms from different backgrounds. And I think it depends a lot on what kind of background you have, what kind of career path you have. And for many women is something they put on hold until they're ready. A lot of people put their baby plans on hold, but I see, I meet, I met a mom recently who was on her 13th baby. Like some parents are perfectly happy and should be completely content with one. It's such a personal choice. When you have a choice, you don't always have a choice based on your timeline, but it's not my place to judge your choices. Yeah. I'm really glad that you said that because I feel like when you have a baby, the first thing people ask you is, is when are you going to have your second? Right. And one child can certainly be enough for a family. Absolutely. Absolutely. Certainly. It's not quantity, it's quality. First exactly. of all, and it's what works for your family. Everything is about what works for your family because your family is different than the family down the block. Everything about parenting is finding what works for you yeah. uh, and not listening to others who say, oh, that's the wrong way. You got to do it this way. Same thing about pregnancy. I feel like we should have a column, ask Heidi, what would Heidi do? What would Heidi say? Because <laughs> you're amazing. By the way, I answer questions on Instagram. I love that. So share with us some of your pearls here. What's one thing or a couple of things that you wish anyone trying to conceive should know? The most important thing for me, and preconception is a very new field, but getting pregnant, the best thing you can do first is get healthy. That's why I feel preconception should be paid more attention to, especially now, especially now, because planning pregnancy for a time in your life 
that's right for you when all the got the eggs in your bag basket, or hopefully you've got them in some basket that you can share, but ducks in in a row, but help that you are healthy, that your weight is where you want it to be. Your partner's weight is where it should be because there's not very much emphasis on the role of fathers. We all know that they contribute a sperm, but the health of that sperm is dependent on, and in some ways, the health of that pregnancy is dependent on a father's health. So getting both of you into tip-top baby making shape is one of the best things that you can do. So scheduling your preconception consult, getting a full checkup, dental checkup, because a lot of people say your gum suffered during pregnancy and that can lead to complications. But the problem is you have to treat those problems before sperm and egg meet. So your weight, your lifestyle, your eating habits, Also, a mental health checkup. So if you are under treatment for a mood disorder, or if you've ever been under treatment for a mood disorder, getting that either under control, if it's under control, great, but going over all the medications you take and your partner takes before you start TTC That's really important. A lot of moms decide, well, I'll just chuck the antidepressants because they must be bad for the baby. And that's a big mistake to make. You should never wean yourself off medication without medical supervision. And you might be setting yourself up for perinatal mood disorder. Those are some of the fundamental steps to take. And then lying back and enjoying the journey, having fun getting pregnant if you can, and focusing on your relationship. Just such great advice. And I tell my patients, nurture yourself and imagine that you're pregnant right now. And I think sometimes we treat our bodies like trash. And then we're like, once we're pregnant, then we start taking good care of ourselves, sleeping well, hydrating well, eating healthy. And we should really be focusing on that before we even get pregnant. So I'm so glad you said that. And cutting back on caffeine. You don't have to cut it out entirely. Cutting out drinking. Because you never know when that egg and sperm will meet and make a baby. So taking your prenatal vitamin way in advance before you start trying, not once you become pregnant. Right, right. Okay, so what about, what's something that you wish someone who's pregnant right now, what should they know? That, that first of all, you're not alone. You're not the only one with those crazy symptoms that don't seem at all related to pregnancy. What does a nosebleed or sinus infections have to do with making a baby? It seems completely unrelated. Red palms or just your feet growing. What has this got to do with making a baby? But there are lots of different things that hormones do that are not necessarily, they don't sound like they make a lot of sense, but they actually are, there's a purpose behind all of those weird symptoms, it makes it really challenging. So know that you're not alone. Know that every pregnancy is different. Every labor and delivery is different. And as much as you can, keep your mind open. Ask your doctor or midwife any questions that you have. Never, there's no such thing as a silly question. If it's important to you, it should be important to your provider. And just speak up. I think especially for Black moms, we know that often they aren't heard. They aren't listened to, especially when it comes to pain that they experience or symptoms they're experiencing. And that's why we have a higher incidence of maternal mortality in certain communities because really nobody's paying attention. And it has nothing to do with socioeconomic level. It just has to do with inherent bias. So make sure you speak up. Something else I would recommend for everyone is a doula. I would say if you could do, doulas are a must do because they will be there to advocate for you, to be by your side. They don't take the place of your partner. They are just this incredible source of support. Doctors come and go, even midwives come and go, nurses come and go on different shifts, hopefully not too many shifts. And But the doula is there by your side from the first contraction. And I think studies have shown that women who have a doula-assisted birth are less likely to need interventions or less likely to suffer from postpartum depression. 
because often the births are less traumatic. That's my, probably my best advice for if you're pregnant. And I love that. And I would say that maybe like three years ago, I wasn't telling patients in my field of work to get a fertility coach, but I actually recommend now that patients, not my patients, because they have me, but right. patients who don't have me guiding them along the way, just like you said, doctors come and go. Patients are going to these huge centers with six to yeah. 10 doctors. They never see a doctor except maybe for 10 minutes, just on one video yeah. call. But that coach will not come and go. That coach will be there for you and be there to handhold you. And I would say that maybe time to pregnancy is shorter if you have some someone like that in your life. So thank yeah, you for saying that's that. That's a really important point. And I need to add that to what to expect before you're expecting. So give me all the details. <laughs> I will. I that's will. really important. I will. And what is your advice for families right now? Families right now have a lot going on. They have a lot of challenges. Even if COVID were behind us, which let's face it, it isn't yet. And there's always something else around the corner that's adding to stress. I think moms have, a, parents have a way, but especially moms have a way of demanding perfection in themselves. And in so many ways, making everything top priority and you can't do that. It's not humanly possible. And again, we are human parents. Letting the little things go, not the little things in your arms, but the little things that don't matter as much, prioritizing what's important to you and your family. And I think also staying connected as partners, seeing each other as partners, not only See, I'm a big dad advocate. So like I am always talking about dads and how important they are to the process. And not just as someone who's contributing that important sperm, but as someone who stays connected through pregnancy and through the entire journey, not as a babysitter, as a co-parent. And I know that can have a different connotation, but you are in this together as a team. There's nothing that a mom can do that a dad can't do just as well, if not better, given the opportunity, except for breastfeed. But beyond that, we're working on it. <laughs> but yeah, I think being presenting as a team makes you stronger. Being, being united makes you stronger and makes your family stronger and feel more secure. Advocate. I love that. So how can people find you and your books and organization? And I would also love for you to share more with us about the What to Expect Foundation. So you can find me on social media and I am so easy to find. It's not even funny. So it's at Heidi Murkoff. Literally, if you message me and you ask me a question, I will not only accept it, but I will answer it because every mom means so much to me and dads too. Dads always will ask me questions that they have. And then the app is the What to Expect app. And then you get weekly updates, video updates from me and lots of personalized information. But the What to Expect project is so important for me. It's really the heart of what we do. I love everything except writing, by the way, everything else. The interaction, doing this, just loving on moms. That's what it's all about for me and advocating for them. So the What to Accept project actually started after I attended a little seminar for pregnant inmates at Rikers Island. And what I noticed right away again is that every mom wants the best for her baby. And with that in mind, we started this foundation that would inform and empower every mom as much as possible. So we do a lot. We I've been all over the world hugging up a storm, refugee camps and displaced person camps, every, just about everywhere. We have lots of programs. The one that I actually just got back from a baby shower at Fort Riley, we have done maybe 300 baby showers for military moms around the world. So that's probably 30,000 moms or so. During COVID, it was really hard because we had to do them virtually, but it's all about the hugs and the support and the celebration. Because if you can imagine the isolation of being thousands of miles away from your family and your friends and your usual network of support, that's daily life. 
for a military mom. And during COVID, that's been exponentially harder. It's been exponentially harder for every one of us. But say you're stationed in Japan or you were when this all started, you didn't see your family for two years. You didn't, grandparents couldn't come and visit. So you're going through this all on your own. That's one of the favorite things I do, but we're also going back to DC. Next week, we go all the time to advocate for maternal health for military moms, but also for moms who don't care, get the care that they need and deserve, including preconception care, which is currently not a, a given in a state that hasn't expanded Medicaid. Lots of moms out there who need lots of support. And as long as there are, we're going to be out there supporting them with the What to Expect Project. Oh, and we have Bump Day every every year. That's the third, the third Wednesday, of course, Bump Day. In July every year, we just recently had our eighth annual. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, I, along the lines of advocating for preconception care, I have this dream that you just go to this website, you say, I'm trying to conceive. And then we, I mean, as a society, we have to start now because we're generations off from, we, we've basically screwed up at least two generations in terms yeah. of plastic exposure, poor health. And like you said, no preconception care, things are going to get so bad. And if we don't do it now, like it's just going to get worse. I want meals delivered, vitamins delivered. You know what I mean? Get people hooked up to exactly what you're talking about. Have mm -hmm. a consult with a doctor, a mental health specialist, even before trying to conceive. And the time really needs to be now. On the note, I think it's really important. We have skyrocketing rates of diabetes in this country and heart disease and other chronic conditions that are in many cases completely avoidable, preventable. We think it's something that happens later on, but in fact, your baby's chances of later on developing type 2 diabetes are at least partially determined by your health before conception and at the moment of conception and during pregnancy. So we really, it's I call it the ultimate in preventive care and in, in terms of healthcare costs, if you actually get women healthy, couples healthy before they get pregnant, we would lower healthcare costs, special care during pregnancy, complications during pregnancy, NICU care, lifelong care, rates of diabetes and cancer and hypertension, you name it. So it's such a smart investment, anything that invests in the health of women invests in the future of our country. If moms aren't healthy, none of us are going to be healthy. Yeah. And the other thing that I want to also promote, so when you go to DC, please talk to them about this is first trimester leave, because I feel like as a society, we still cause women to feel shame when they're pregnant and they can't talk mm -hmm. about it at work and they hide their pregnancy and they're not taking care of themselves because they don't want any of their throwing up or they're not sleeping well, they still make themselves go to work. And I feel like we have to support women in the first trimester. There's not enough support for women who are doing the, ultimate, the, the heaviest lift of all. They're nurturing our future. Right. So all of this is weighing on them. And instead of supporting them, we just say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and get back to work. That's not okay. No. We need to support them through the process. And also we need preconception care and fertility care to be affordable for every couple who needs it. I find it just unacceptable that it's for wealthy people only, or you have to throw away your savings. Or if you're a military family who makes very little, maybe you can't afford it at all. We should be offering a continuum of care for every woman who wants to become pregnant, every couple, every family. Absolutely. I mean, it's about love, showing people love. And if we show them love that they're important and they're important to this world. I mean, I can go on and on about the other downstream things that we'll see that will decline like mental Absolutely. health illness. And also exactly school, for me, it's school shootings. I feel like people are like, what? I'm like, no, literally. I feel like if you show people love before they're even an embryo, potentially we can change what we're seeing right now. But like I said, we're generations away from that. And so we really need to act now, but we have to catch up. 
we have to catch up with other countries who do a far better job of nurturing women in general. We're not giving them the support that they need and deserve. And by the way, it's good for the economy. Yes, for sure. <laughs> Cost saving, but also makes women stay in the workforce if they're supported. And we all know women are better at everything. So it's a win-win. <laughs> well, Heidi, I've so enjoyed our talk today. I mean, I just feel so fortunate and lucky. And I'm one of those people that reached out to you on Instagram and you replied to me within seconds. So I just feel so honored. So thank you so much for taking this invitation to talk to us today. No, I'm so happy that we had a chance to chat and more more where that came from. Exactly. I look forward to the next time. Thank you so much. And thank you for what you do for moms. Yeah.